Yeah, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> your soul is welcome here. So is your body. <laughs> so are you and all your imperfections. And we'll be talking about that today. You know, the last couple of weeks I've been talking about life. And I've been using the big hose, remember? I thought maybe you got tired of the hose, so I didn't bring the hose with me today. But you remember the hose, and we said, life flows through me. Life is this amazing flow of energy and truth and, and, and just that supports us in whatever we want to do. It's, it's life itself breathing me. We can't even breathe on our own. Life breathes us. And we use the hose to say, you know, we can kink up that hose sometimes. And we limit the amount of life that is coming through. You know, just like electricity, you know, during meditation, we limited the amount of light in here, but we can turn it back up again, too, and we can do that with the hose. Life itself. Life itself. But today I want to talk about the other life. The other life that expresses from that flow of life. The other life. And the life that I want to talk about is, is the, the story that we have come to create up until this time. Everybody has a life story, don't we? And we have some really great stories about our life. We have some amazing and powerful stories in our life. And we have some eh, not so stellar stories. Some of the ones that may be hidden. Some of the ones that eh, we don't share very often or maybe not at all. We have all those stories. And all those stories, the story of our entire life, is the tapestry that we've created. It's the palette. That we've, that we've created. This is the story of our life. The story of our life. And it comes from everything that, that we've experienced, all the beliefs we have, all the ideas about life and how life works, where we went to school, how we grew up, all those things that were the opposite of the life throwing through us. It's life expressed from us. Life expressed from us is what we've created out here this life. The story of our life, our human story, our human story. And these stories are our stories, simply. We don't have to judge ourselves about them. You know, they, they are our stories, but we get hung up on them sometimes. And the question I want to explore today has to do with owning that story. Do we own that story? Are we okay with that story? Are we trying to hide from that story in any way? And what does it mean to own the story? Because the story of your life, the, the good stuff and the not so good stuff that we claim, it brought you all here to this time and space right here. All of it brought you right here. All of it. A different decision in any one place in your life would put you probably on a different trajectory and you might not be sitting right here. Don't you think that? If you married a different person, if you went to a different school, if you had a different family environment, you know, all those things. If, if you just hadn't made those choices and decisions, you might not even be sitting here. You'd be somewhere else. You would have landed somewhere else with those stories of your life. And that's the truth about stories, simply. But we're talking about owning the story because we don't like to own all the pieces of it. We like to own the big stuff and the good stuff and the juicy stuff, usually. But what does it mean to own your story? Well, I've been taking some of my comments, and I will over the next couple times I speak, from a book by Brene Brown called The Gifts of Imperfection. And she says this about our stories. She says, the critical piece in owning our story is to be able to not care about what other people think of our story. A critical piece to be able to own our story is to not be concerned with what others think of our story. Whether they think we succeeded or didn't succeed, whether they thought we, we had accomplishments or not, whether they think we're a good parent, whether they think we're a good human being. We need to get away from worrying about what other people think about our story. Some of us do that, don't we? And the other thing we need to get, get away from is to stop apologizing for pieces of our story that we're not so proud of. I'm talking about apologizing for missteps that happened last year or 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. We need to stop apologizing for that. Because she says this about that, that apologizing for it and feeling we have to apologize and being concerned about what other people think of our story, it keeps alive in us this idea of being unworthy. 
That's where unworthiness springs from. You hear what I'm saying? That's where it springs from. She says this in her book. When we can let go of what other people think and actually own our story, we gain access to our worthiness. Do you hear that? When we can let go of what other people think and own our story, all of it, we gain access to our worthiness. The feeling that we are enough just the way we are and that we are worthy of love and belonging. When we spend a lifetime trying to distance ourselves from the parts of our lives that don't fit with who we think we're supposed to be, we stand outside of our story and what happens is we hustle for our worthiness by constantly performing, perfecting, pleasing, and proving. Our sense of worthiness, that critically important piece that gives us access to love and belonging, lives inside of our story. It lives inside of our story. See, this is the paradox about worthiness. This is the paradox about worthiness. In order to feel worthy, I have to embrace my imperfection. In order to feel worthy, I have to own my whole story. And it's not perfect. Anybody perfect in here? I'm always afraid somebody's going to raise their hand. <laughs> if you do, I'm going to bring you up here and you're going to give the lesson. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. But in order to feel worthy, we have to own our own imperfection. You see how that works? We have to be okay in our own skin. We have to be all right with it. And then we gain access to what so many of us look for, which is the feeling of worthiness, the feeling that we have, the feeling that we're good enough all the time, right now. Well, that doesn't sound so hard, does it? You know, but what, what, why, why don't we feel that worthiness ever? Even if we knew that, that we had to own our story, why don't we feel that worthiness? Well, Brene Brown says, there's a way we think about worthiness that limits our ability to feel that, and she says this. She says, we feel that worthiness has prerequisites. That there are prerequisites for worthiness. There are prerequisites for worthiness. Things like, well, I'll be worthy when I lose 10 more pounds. Or I'll be worthy when, when I go to the gym every day. That, that'll make me worthy. Or when I can sing a song this way or when I'll be able to have this kind of, these kind of clothes and this kind of car and dress in this kind of fashion. I'll be worthy when I get a job that pays $100,000 a year. Then I'll be worthy. When my family functions this way, then I'll, I'll be worthy then. We have all these prerequisites around worthiness. Things that require us to be perfect. Perfect in every way. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. We, 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 never, get, we never get to there. Because, see, even if we attain some of those things, even if we attain that graduate degree, even if we attain a job that pays an X amount of money, we realize soon after that that feeling of worthiness goes away quickly. Because the worthiness doesn't come from outside of ourselves, you see. It doesn't come from outside. It comes from owning our own story. It comes from being comfortable in our own skin. Now. Not when and if, but now. So what limits us from that feeling? What limits us from the feeling of worthiness? Well, here's what Brene says about it. She says, there is this idea that we have and way of being that limits us, and it's called shame. She says, shame is basically the fear of being unlovable. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Shame keeps worthiness away by convincing us that owning our story will lead people to think less of us. Shame is all about fear. We're afraid that people won't like us if they know the truth about us, about who we are, 
about where we came from, about what we believe, about how much we're struggling, and believe it or not, how wonderful we are when we're soaring. So sometimes it's just as hard to own our own strengths as our struggles. People often want to believe that shame is reserved for folks who have survived terrible traumas or who have done terrible things, but that's not true. Shame is something we all experience. And while it feels as if shame hides in our darkest corners, actually it tends to lurk in all of the familiar places, including appearance and body image, family, parenting, money and work, health, addiction, sex, aging, and religion. To feel shame, she says, is to be human. To feel shame. To feel not good enough. That gut-wrenching feeling of not good enough, no matter what, where I lived, how much money I have, what I look like now. All those things we're ashamed of. We're ashamed of owning our own story of how we got here. That's what it is. So there's a way to get out of the shame game, though. We don't have to stay there. You know, our story is our story, and it's what brought us here. But we, don't, we have an opportunity to create any story we want from here on out. We can own what we've come to because it brought us right here. We can say, hey, you know what? I made it. I made it through my story. Don't you wish you could just go back to a point in your story where you felt really terrible and say, listen, you're going to make it. You know, you make it. You make it through this story. Okay? We can own it without getting stuck in it. We don't have to be stuck in it. We can go from here forward and stop playing the shame game. Stop playing the shame game. So I was thinking about that. I was thinking ways that we can do that now. How, how can we start to practice getting ourselves out of that shame place of not good enough and not owning our story? We don't have to go back and dig up our whole story. We, we don't have to do that. I was thinking of this one practice that we can do that will help us. And that is this. How about if we all are able to say more often, I'm wrong and I'm sorry? What about if we just practice saying, I'm wrong and I'm sorry? Because it happens. Guess what? You're not perfect. Neither am I. So it happens sometimes. You say, I'm sorry. I'm wrong about that. You see, it doesn't then require us to carry that weight around with us and having to put up the front as if we're being right. You know? Just say it. What, what if everybody did that? It would be amazing, right? We wouldn't have to carry that. Our story would not be one of carrying the weight of that around. We simply say, I'm sorry I was wrong, and release it. That's a way to do it. How about this one? I think that more often we should ask for help. We should be able to ask for help, humbly ask for help. Not with, you better get over here and help me because I need you now, but to humbly ask for help. You see, when we start off in this world as children, we need a lot of help. We need a lot of nurturing. We need the people to pay attention to us. And many of us who are going to go out on the other side, and some we've seen go out, they need a lot of attention and a lot of help. They need to be able to learn to ask for help over again, many of them, because this whole middle time of our life, we feel so fiercely independent. We don't need anybody's help. We put up this front as if we can do it all ourselves. Guess what? We can't. We can't always do that. So I think that if we begin to ask for help, it actually, we actually are telling ourselves, you know what, I'm not perfect. I have some imperfections, and I can ask for some help. That's a good way to, to begin to practice that. Another way is to, to quit pretending and performing when we're in the presence of other people. Stop pretending like, like everything's okay when it's not. And I'm not saying tell everybody your troubles all the time. But I'm saying that we need to be more authentic. We're not authentic enough, I don't think. In, in enough circumstances. We want to pretend 
and try to prove things that aren't really true. We put on that facade, okay? Too often. Let's stop doing that. What about if we stop doing that so often? Especially with people that care about us. Especially with people that care about us. Other ways to get out of the shame game. I said before, and I'll say it again, we need to stop apologizing for our imperfections. We need to stop being sorry that we can't do something or be something to someone. Just stop apologizing. It doesn't mean you're not kind. It doesn't mean you don't care. But stop apologizing for your own imperfections. I've got them. I've got them. You've got them. We've got them. We've got the imperfections. Stop apologizing for them. And stop trying to stop worrying about what other think people think about your story. We need to stop doing that. We need to be conscious that what other people think matters way too much. Way too much. Because all of these things contribute to that feeling inside of being unworthy. So I want to share a story with you now that I think is a great inspiration, can be a great inspiration to us about owning your own story. And it's a story I read online last year about this time, it was in January of last year. And it's about a young man called Nick Santanastasso. Here's, it was in the um, online on the Today website or by Scott Stump. He said, when Nick was two years old, his father left him alone in the living room floor while he went into the garage for a moment, only to hear an odd clanking noise a few minutes later. Nick was born with Hanhart syndrome, a rare birth defect that left him with no legs, an undeveloped right arm, and a left arm with one finger. Doctors told his parents that his mobility would be limited. <laughs> Surprise! I opened the garage door, his father said, and Nick had pushed his wagon up next to the table, climbed onto the wagon, gotten up onto a chair before pushing himself onto the table. And he was on the table watching MTV and dancing. <laughs> Since he was two years old, he has been shocking us with the things he does. Well, Nick is now in high school, and last year he was the star in an online video that went viral then, last January where he is made up to look like a zombie and pops out from underneath the table to startle the unsuspecting actor Norman Reedus, who is the star of a popular TV horror drama called The Walking Dead. Never seen it. Anybody ever seen The Walking Dead? All right, so you yeah. have? Nick said, I got into Vine. Now, Vine is this website where you can post videos. So he got into Vine and he said he thought, what can I do that I would be best at? No legs basically no arms, and he's saying, what can I do that I would be best at? He said, I wanted to do something that no one else could do, and I came up with zombie. <laughs> Some people were like, that's fake, I can see his legs and his pants, and I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> he said, I did something that catches people's attention, because you don't really see people like me around. You know, he's the youngest of four children, and his parents found out about this possible complication before his birth. But they said, you know, we're going to let nature take its course, and we'll prepare our children that, that their brother might be a little different, and that's okay. His father said he lives by inspiring others not to sit idle. He can't change who he is, but he's not going to stop living because of that. So now I want you to meet. Nick Santa Nastasa. Can you turn the lights down up here, please? Nick said, I've never met anyone with hand heart syndrome that I have. Sometimes I wish I was normal, to be honest. But then I look at what I'm doing and how many people I'm inspiring, and I'm pleased with what I'm doing. It's just that everyone has their bad days now and then. From the moment he made it up onto that table to dance to MTV at age two, Nick has been on the move. He used a skateboard to get around while growing up, 
He learned to play the drums. He's tried out seemingly every sport from football to dodgeball to ping pong. He even went scuba diving, diving a few years ago. And he's probably by now has his driver's license. So his family's in the process of modifying a car for him. He became accustomed to all the stares and whispers of strangers when they see him. He has prosthetic <clears throat> legs, but listen to this. He doesn't use them in public, saying, it just wouldn't be me. In school, he uses a wheelchair to get around the hallways. After some prodding from friends and the Central Region High School head coach, Chris Loveland, Nick came out for the wrestling team last season as a junior. This would have been two years ago. He wrestles in the 106-pound weight class, and he weighs only 85 pounds, the minimum allowed to compete. He weighs 20 pounds less than almost all of his components, uh, opponents. Nick said, wrestling is a lesson. I grew up with failure. Failure made me who I am. And in wrestling, there's a lot of failure. I've had a lot of losses, but you just learn from it and get stronger. And you realize who you are and how strong you are mentally, physically, and emotionally. It's made me a better person. And I think people have respect for me because I do it. But I also do it because someone who doesn't think they can wrestle will look at me and go, wow, that kid has no legs and he's wrestling, so let me try it. Nick is not somebody to sit on the sidelines and never has been, his father said. He comes up with all these creative ways to get himself out there and try to live life to the fullest. He keeps us all wondering what he's going to do next. Huh? He's living his story. This is his story. This is Nick's story. There's no prerequisites. Not even arms and legs and hands and feet. There are no prerequisites. None. He's, he's, he's acknowledging it. Can you turn the lights up, please? He's acknowledging it. He's present with it. What am I going to do with this life? What am I going to do with this story? What am I going to do with it? How am I going to be? What am I going to be the best at? What am I going to be the best at? A zombie, a wrestler, anything. When we own our story is when we come from worthiness. When we own all of it, all the great stuff and all the not so great stuff, we come from worthiness. And from worthiness is where we want to write the next chapters. From being worthy, from feeling worthy from being okay in our own skin, from accepting our imperfections and using them to be all that we came here to be. Are you with me? Yes. Let's give Nick a round of applause. Huh?